On the podcast today, we are going to examine chapter 5 of the Tao Te Ching, which makes up the fifth episode of the 81 Meditations of the Tao Te Ching, if you are new to the channel. Yep. And if you'd like to go and uh, see the previous episodes, and they're all there in the video list. And so for those who are new, just as a little refresher about the Tao Te Ching, I would like to read to you just a little bit of Jacob Needleman's actual introduction to the Tao Te Ching by Jia Fu Feng and Jane English. This is just to give you a little bit of a refresher on what sort of the Tao Te Ching is and the Tao itself. So the Tao Te Ching is a work of metaphysical psychology, taking us far beyond the social or biological factors that have been the main concern of modern psychology. It helps us see how the fundamental forces of the cosmos itself are mirrored in our own individual inner structure. And it invites us to try to live in direct relationship to all these forces. To see truly and to live fully, this is what it means to be authentically human. So that's just kind of just a brief summary of what, you know, the Tao Te Ching and the Tao. And so, as we said, we're going to be talking about the fifth chapter. And actually, the fifth chapter is, is a, a peculiar chapter, yeah? a little bit difficult for people to understand mm. if you're not familiar with Tao's philosophy Tao psychology, so forth, you know, the, the Taoist worldview, so to speak. And if you're not familiar with some of the words and terminology, and there are many different translations of this fifth chapter, many bad translations, <laughs> but we'll read Jia Fu Feng's translation. So chapter five goes, heaven and earth are impartial. They see the 10,000 things as they are. The wise are impartial. They see the people as they are. The space between heaven and earth is like a bellows. The shape changes, but not the form. The more it moves, the more it yields. More words count less. Hold fast to the center. Very interesting chapter. Uh, and can be quite confusing, actually, for a lot of people, because if you're not familiar with, I guess, the idea of the bellows and uh, heaven and earth and more words count less which is not something that people think about in the modern day more words count more <laughs> in the modern day and so and, and especially the idea of impartiality which which is builds a common theme and makes a return constantly through the Tao Te Ching this yes. idea of impartiality which is a hallmark of the Tao Te Ching and the Zhuangzi so Let's have a look at it from the beginning. So heaven and earth are impartial. So heaven and earth here being the, the heavens and earth itself. So, and you can also think about that also as yang and yin if you want, mm. if, you, if you want to go that far. Yes. Uh, but you can think of also heaven and earth in a sense as the Tao, right? Like mm. the, 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 the fundamental forces of the Tao, which would yes. be yang and yin. So. Mm. It's uh, it's basically like um, the reality of nature itself, isn't mm, it? Like yes. all reality of universe itself, yes. and that infinite uh, space, the something that uh, conceivable and inconceivable. It it contains uh, everything, which that's a limitless space that mm. that itself is a heaven and earth. And again, I find the Tao Te Ching, and not just Tao Te Ching, the Taoist text itself can be very um, vague and difficult for a lot of people who don't have um, an uh, advanced knowledge on this because uh, it's very simplified and it's very metaphorical. Yes. So that if you don't have a background understanding of uh, Chinese culture, ancient Chinese culture, and the uh, traditional uh, wisdom traditions of China, then it can become very um, like superficial understanding, mm. or it can be just a super simplified version of understanding. So that it's very important to understand that um, this is metaphor that's been used in each chapter mm. is something that we need to actually dive deep into. Exactly, we have to understand it from the Chinese context from. Mm you know, the language as well, right? Like, because we can read a lot of English translations and ensure it in a certain way. Mm. But we need to really unpack, like, what do they mean by heaven and earth? What do they mean by 
the bellows? Like what's, like you said, what's the metaphorical understanding to understand a deeper message? Like It's usually when you actually get to understand a deeper, deeper understanding of these metaphors, then you kind of realize that uh, the true sense of this m- meaning of each chapter is completely opposite from what you thought of mm. it in English version. Yes. Yeah, so it's actually, it's very important to mm. um, dive deeply into what they really mean. Exactly. Well, the thing is like, you know, like if we look at the first line, if we look at heaven and earth, like you said, it, we're talking about nature itself, right? Nature itself, like the nature of the cosmos, basically. And so the nature of the cosmos itself is impartial to all things. It treats everything as equal. It doesn't have like someone it holds up above others because in Taoism there's especially not this idea of judgment or sin or that you are blessed. You are part of something much greater than yourself, but you are just a part of it. Mm. And so everything is treated equally by nature this is the idea in this first line so heaven and earth treat everything equally Mm. and so you i everyone listening and watching are all treated equally so in some sense it's kind of you can think of uh nature some people think of nature in the sense of a machine because a machine is sort of unaware of the effects of its actions Mm. right so and i think that's a good representation because nature just does what it does so it doesn't care if a storm knocks your house down or if you know your piano fell out of the window accidentally and killed a dog or something like this you know what i mean it's the it's not aware of the the, the effects of its actions it's just a, it's a happening like almost like an eternal becoming mm. right and so that's kind of the idea here that this this impartial view like that nature doesn't uh, favor one over the other there's yeah for example a flood or drought happens mm. for example like you said the storm happens and then mm. the houses get knocked down by a storm and this and that mm. we perceive as a disaster yes because that's uh, how we judge things within our human reality yeah. and in our human level of the dramas yeah. that we judge to, uh, that's disaster yes that's, that's disaster yes but in the uh, Taoist perspective, it's it's not disaster or it's a good thing. It's just, uh, yeah, in an, in itself, it happens itself. Mm. And mm. It doesn't take any side. No. It does what it, it, it does. It does what, what it does. does. It does what and, it does, yeah. Um, flood and drought and this and that is just the outcome of the... Of nature. Of nature, yeah. of that just the happening. That's what nature does. Yes, exactly. So... How we respond to it is just up to us, but that's what nature does. That's what nature does, yeah. Mm. Just as we urinate, we eat, exactly. we poop. Yeah. Nature nature thunders, nature lightnings, nature rains. I know it's interesting to say it like that, but that's mm. what nature does. Nature yes. floods, yes. nature droughts. Mm. This is what nature does. Mm. And we have to navigate through that yes. on an individual level. And that's yes. why this, this chapter is actually really important. Mm. And so you have to really try to grasp that idea of impartiality. So like the first line saying heaven and earth are impartial is this idea that nature itself sort of provides an equal plentitude. Mm. So it's like the idea in the Tao Te Ching that the Tao loves and nourishes all but does not lord and earth them. So Mm. the the Tao or nature here provides, you know, nature being the Tao, provides an equal plentitude so Mm -hmm. what you are offered that's Mm -hmm. you know it's it's providing everyone with equal thing then but then you could say oh well what about social stuff and this and that well that's that's the human life Mm -hmm. right that the social dynamics and and poverty and this and that but nature itself the Tao itself provides an equal plentitude you're Mm -hmm. both we all we all have blood pumping through our system we have a mind and so forth and so on right so so when nature provides an equal plentitude uh, and it's impartial. It doesn't see different. It doesn't differentiate between life and death, good and bad, right and wrong. These are all a process of nature, right? And so, like the importance of this chapter is for each individual to have this sense of impartiality. Mm. And so, like, but the problem is in human life because we get attracted to the drama. Like you said, we get caught in a particular situation, then. 
we suffer. So we don't have that impartial view. And it's not easy too, mind you, like when things do happen to you on an individual level, it is difficult, right? Yes. So like if you do lose your house in a bushfire, I mean, that is, you know, a, a tra- for yourself personally, a traumatic experience. But maybe for someone else living somewhere else, they could they don't know anything about it. Mm. So, but this is what nature does. Nature sees life, death, birth, all of this just as process. This is life, natural process. Yeah. But we see it as, oh, you know, it's wonderful. Our child is born. And then, oh, you know, you get sad. Your grandpa or your grandma or your parents are getting sick and dying. You know, and that they themselves are suffering because they don't want to leave. They're attached. And the problem is that um, without having to understand the life uh, in a like a non-biased way, mm. we always get attracted to have this uh, experience in of uh, pleasure. Mm. Like that's, and we also desire to experience only pleasurable, um, pleasurable. Um, experiences right yeah. and then we get attached to that a sense of pleasure and that is uh, that becomes a problem to make um, equal judgment yes. in things well that's partiality yes right like your, your, your attraction to pleasure is partiality and that's what the whole Tao Te Ching is is in some sense explaining to people is that you, you have to get out of this sense of partiality because mm. it's causing you to suffer so you are seeking pleasurable experiences and you know fantastic experiences but they can't last forever so you have to understand that you have to have a balance between like you have to also appreciate the times when nothing is happening and and so forth and so on right like there can't be an attraction to one or the other yeah. and that's the impartial view right so nature itself or the Tao is impartial to either or it does, the Tao could care less if you have a pleasurable experience or mm. if you smashed a hammer on your hand it doesn't care. This is this is the Tao. Yeah. Like so, it's it's impartial to the experience. So, and this again is non duality, right? Like because you are getting out of the experiential perspective of being attracted to either or, good or bad, right yeah. or wrong, life or death. You know, mm-hmm. I don't want to die, but I'm yeah. hanging on to life and this mm-hmm. and that. But if you had an impartial view, as a sage does, then you you allow everything to come. And you do it with grace. Mm. And you do it with, you know, a certain dignity yes. about yourself. So mm. so the second line actually it says, you know, they see the 10,000 things as they are. Now, as people will already know from watching, if, if, if you have watched or listened to the first episodes, then the 10,000 things is kind of, the, a descri- you know, a, 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 a beautiful way to describe the myriad of things in reality. So yes. in the whole universe. So all the things that we can think of as a thing mm. and and see that's that's the 10,000 things right so the manifest world itself is the is the 10,000 things so the myriad of things now this is an interesting one this is where a lot of people get confused and this is where you have to actually study a little bit of, uh, or get to know some chinese to understand what they're talking about like so they see the 10,000 things as they are so what does that mean as they are like and so in chinese the as they are part, it actually describes uh, straw dogs. And so straw dogs, and so this is important in translations, right? I'm not saying Jia Feng Fu is not translating this correctly, but if you don't have <clears throat> a correct understanding of or a command of Chinese, Chinese or other translations, then this may be confusing. Yeah. So straw dogs actually means like it, 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 a straw dog is what they used to use in ancient Chinese uh Still, do it, still, some people do in ancient Chinese rituals where a dog is made of straw, and the straw dog can represent a creature or all living creatures. It can represent the 10,000 things as well. And so, the idea here is that with the straw dog, right, we, we have the straw dog for the ritual, but when, up, what happens after the ritual? You throw it away or you burn it. So, there's, there's a lack of attachment to the straw dog but Mm. the straw dog has a function and a purpose Mm. in the ritual itself so uh so as it says here like that they that heaven and earth see the ten thousand things as straw dogs Mm. it sees we are straw dogs Mm. so heaven and earth sees people as straw dogs so we are going through our own ritual in life but at the end of the at the end of the day, 
<laughs> nature discards of us as anything, mm. like anything. Yes. But there's different ways to look at this too. Like, like for example, like for you and I, you know, we love each other and our life together is important. Mm. But someone in Venezuela or Guyana or something like they could care less about you. Yeah. So, now that not in a not in a in a very like lack, lacking empathy, they just don't. They're not invested in your life. Mm. So essentially, t- t- from their perspective, we are sh- straw, straw dogs. dogs. Yeah. You know, so. That's kind of that impart that comes back to that impartial view, right? Mm. So, so heaven and earth see us as mm. straw dogs, yeah. like um, completely um, neutral perspective. Completely neutral perspective. That's yeah. right. Completely neutral perspective. So it's like, so yeah, you know, we're all straw dogs, but we're all part of Tao, right? So mm. we're all straw dogs. We're all part of Tao, and um, like I said, you might be special to your family. You might be special to your husband or your wife mm. or to your kids. Mm. But outside of the general scope of probably your immediate environment, you're not special at all. Yeah. And this, again, is the net heaven and earth's impartial perspective. Yes. You are just a part of the 10,000 things. You are a straw dog. Ten, the 10,000 things itself is a straw dog. Mm. And so it will use you the way it intends to use you and then yeah. discard of you after the so-called ritual Mm -hmm. now that's not saying that you don't have Mm -hmm. certain control of your life of course you do it's your ritual yes and we'll get into that further because that that comes back into coming to align with the Tao and Mm -hmm. accessing the bellows which we'll get into yeah it's like um you play your role just like straw dogs Mm -hmm. on on when the stage is set right so and the ritual is set Mm -hmm. and the time to do their um, worshipping and things like that. The straw dogs uh, take their roles, yes. right? Yeah. But once that the ritual is finished, then they yeah, get discarded yeah, and yeah. whatnot. Yeah, just like our human life, isn't it? We, we, uh, we play our like, uh, so-called roles and when yeah. the stage is set, the so-called in our daily life mm. and whatnot, mm. that once um, time comes when about the time to depart this world and yeah then we get um, this physical body is kind of just a bag of soup bag of meat basically mm-hmm. and then uh, get uh, discarded or whatever yeah happens yeah, yeah exactly yeah. yeah well that's it like a short like you said a short dog serves a specific function or purpose yes but there is no emotional attachment to it mm. you see like well, after the ritual is done it's gone so that means that um, straw dog. Oh, it's a, just just an object. But straw straw dog itself understand their role. Yeah. Same as if we were to understand our role in this life, yeah. and not but not to not get attached to it, mm. then we can we we should be able to perceive ten thousand things as straw dogs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we need to have see which we'll get into the next part is that the sage's impartiality as well, Mm. which is part of the chapter. Yes. So we have to acquire that same perception Mm -hmm. that like the 10,000 things itself are, we see as straw dogs. We are neither attached, emotionally attached, and and we don't, we don't have a sense of partiality. So once like, you know, to use the straw dog as a metaphor, once the ritual is over, you throw it away. We're not saying here you just throw humans away and you could care less. (laughs) But the idea here is that that's the, the, the object, mm. the ultimate perception of a sage and the objective of the Tao. Like mm. the, the purpose of a straw dog is to come and back into resonance with the Tao. That's the whole idea. So back into resonance with its function and purpose uh, as nature intended, you know. So, and we all have that, and we've explained that numerous times through the virtue and through Li, through uh, organic, our own personal organic pattern. And so, um, so the objective perspective is kind of that, you know, life and death and everything else occurs in, in complete impartiality. And so that's the way that the heaven and earth sees, or that's the way things are in heaven and earth, and that's the way that impartial view is the sage's view. And so kind of the deeper lesson here is that, you know, sh- straw dogs are not made for being emotional and, and caught up in their own subjective viewpoint. 
because you know you serve a particular purpose and function as a, as a straw dog. So, and it's only in understanding or coming back into alignment with the Tao that you can under that you can understand that at a deeper level. But when you're just on the reality of just being a straw dog and caught up, or in, let's say for example, if you're caught up in the emotional realm of a straw dog, then you're never going to like come into alignment with it because you live too much in a in a partial view of the world instead of understanding role mm. of a um, straw dog yeah if you were to think that you are a straw dog yeah, yeah. then that's where the problem begins yes exactly mm. that's when we start to see reality like through a pinhole like yes. because we our subjective view of the world is so small yeah the, the impartiality is completely gone uh, it's gone yeah mm. it's gone because you're just trying to get it get ahead being a straw dog Pretty much, yes. And, you know, like, and so you have to realize, you know, that you, you sort of are a straw dog. And then when you realize you are a straw dog to a certain degree, then you can access, you know, this kind of infinite potential that each and every one of us possess, so to speak, you know. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of like, and and this ties into the, the third line. So you see, well, actually, we'll read the third and the fourth line because that makes more sense. The wise are impartial. They see people as they are. They see people as straw dogs. So the same, like heaven and earth are impartial. They see the 10,000 things okay. as straw dogs. Mm -hmm. And the, the sage sees people as straw dogs. So again, seeing them mm -hmm. uh, not, not with a sense of partiality. So they see everyone as equal. Again, equal. equal. Mm -hmm. It's this, this idea of real equality, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're not concerned about preference or uh, religious agenda or race or you see everyone equal mm. there's no there's no sense of partiality i mean a sage would not do well in the whole the gender politics uh, the whole uh, identity politics that's going on in the world these days but they would need to listen they should listen to a sage because a sage has that impartial view of the world over time, for some reason, we have this. We, we've developed this habit of making life too complicated. I think, yeah, yeah, unnecessarily. Yes, and that's all based on their own desire to earn financial success or status and whatnot, mm. and fame mm. and whatnot. And yeah, we get lost into uh, in our own yeah greed and. Mm desire and, whatnot. Yes. Yes. and so we all think that we are somewhat special than other people and uh, our children are more special than other children and, and mm. things like that mm. what when you get into that drama that side of human drama it's endless that that mm. that complex uh, way of thinking and way of seeing things is infinite. It's mm. going to only get more complicated than not. But when you step back and listen to what Lao Tzu needs to say, then life becomes much more simple. Mm. And it feels like um, your thought gets organized mm. better mm. to perceive your life more objectively mm. and clearly and it becomes much more transparent mm. who to think of what your exist is, mm. existence is and who you really are mm. and how to live your life yeah. in the most genuine and authentic way. Yeah. You know? So that, again, like this chapter emphasized <coughs> that impartiality is something that we uh, need to really, really take on board in our daily life, every moment in our life and mm. to... Um, uh, observe ourselves more objectively more so like ob observe our thoughts mm. that's what it is exactly. so it's uh, yeah it, it makes so much sense and i think it's a such a de-stressor too mm. i think mm. it takes a lot of pressure off you once you understand nobody is special mm. everyone is part of the same thing mm. And no one is above than you, no one is below than you, everyone is equal. Mm. And that perspective that we need to actually practice everyday life to perceive uh, others and other things outside of ourselves equally, but more so our own existence more in a uh, correct manner. Exactly. That is why Zhuangzi made a lot of fun about people attached to their persona, their mm. superficial superficiality. Job titles. Job titles. 
anything, like being too associated with your religion, your race, your sex, your job title, your status in society, anything he would make fun of because you are seeing reality through the pinhole. You are seeing reality in a partial perspective. And as you mentioned well, is that if we can, conti- if you continue to go down that, it gets such so complex that then that's where conflict and confusion arises because the people are confused and they don't understand that they are part of the one fundamental reality as one but they think that they have this separate world isolated from everything and everyone else. And it's not true. Mm. I mean, a a four-year-old knows this because a four-year-old is closer to the source. But once you get educated and once you take on these infectious ideas that society promotes and unintelligent people promote, the next minute you're off down the rabbit hole and you are wound up in all this stuff. And like you said, once you come across Lao Tzu's teachings, and the Tao Te Ching, then you begin to understand that reality itself is impartial, and then that you you it's like a natural return to simplicity mm. without even trying it. You know what I mean? Like it's the Tao Te Ching has an amazing effect on most people, and the the first effect it has is they usually simplify their life mm. and simplify their ways of thinking. Mm. Which is very important, right? Mm. Not just simplifying your life. Okay, you you know you're sweeping your house up, and I mean that's all well and good. Mm. But simplifying your thinking mm. is what's important. Mm. Like you're not getting attracted to this political agenda or this and that. You're not attracted to drama, which means you probably wouldn't be on social media a lot of the time. But <laughs> but you're not attracted to drama. So um, you're attracted just to simplicity, and you are attracted to seeing reality as it truly is. Mm. You know. As the Tao. Yeah, it's a, it has direct influence to transform your life. I exactly, think. exactly, mm. exactly. Mm. And so that's what we, what that, especially that part is trying to say, right? Like that, this, that the, you need to have that sage's view. It's like a dispassionate view of the world. Like you're not attracted to this or that. And this is, again, this aligns with Vairagya in Sanskrit, where the sage or the yogi or the Swami would have a a dispassionate view of the world, like a non-reactive, non-emotional uh, attitude towards the world. And that's, again, from coming back into a deeper alignment, which we get into later in this chapter, but that's essentially what it is. And that's what the world is missing. Like what you said, we're, we're too caught up in this idea of you should have an image, you should have an identity, and but that's what's causing all the problems. So, and it's becoming taboo to talk about that in this day and age because you should have an identity. So as soon as you start to pull apart the pieces of that and you start to expose the, friv- the, the illusion that it is, then the people who are really attracted to that get really uncomfortable, you know. So, <laughs> so anyway, let's go into the next. So we go to the... Uh, there's actually... Th- like if you understand Chinese, there's actually three parts to this chapter. So we've, we've kind of gone through the first section. So the second section, but we'll start with the first, the first. well, let's say the, the fifth line in this chapter, but it's kind of the first line of the second section, is this, the space between heaven and earth is like a bellows. Okay, so the space between heaven and earth like a bellows. First of all, what's a bellow? Yeah, the pumping the air. Pumping the air. Mm. <laughs> pumping the air. Yeah, Do people still have those these days? I don't know. No. Maybe in the maybe if they yeah have maybe a fireplace or something like that. Or countryside or something. countryside. I mean, we don't have a bellows. I don't think mm. I've ever had a bellows in all my whole life. <laughs> but uh, the space between heaven and earth is like a bellows. So um, this is like talking about the space here is kind of like the that infinite infinitude of nothingness, but the power within the Tao that resides in that infinitude of nothingness. Yeah, the infinite infinite space and infinite um, strength, infinite strength power, yeah, power yeah. that it contains. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yes. That's what that's what it really uh, so that so that the idea here is that it's like this uh, the 
the space analogy that they also use in Taoism, where you have the space within the cup. So what what's more valuable, the the cup itself or the space within the cup? And it's obviously the space within the cup. You know, obviously it is important to have a cup too, but mm. it's the space in the cup that that gives it its function and its power and its yes. use, yes. right? And so, likewise, that's that that is a representation of how the Tao is. Mm. The Tao moves and gravitates through that which is empty, like space, mm. and that's where the power comes. Yes. So which is we get into a little bit later how that actually enhances the creative process of someone and mm. you know all sorts of things come from that mm. and so um the so as it says you know to explain that more so the next the next part says the shape changes but not the form oh, okay. now a better translation for this which derek lynn actually translates is empty and yet never exhausted Mm. So they are the same, it's, but it's a, it's a way of saying that the shape changes, but not the form. So things change. So the shape of something will change, but the the power within it never mm. changes. Yeah, in in this uh, shape shape of uh, that empty emptiness, the yep. air. No, well, the shape changes. So like the shape of life changes, and mm. and, and this and that change. Yeah. But not the actual the form here being the. The, the the power of the Tao, yeah. is the space. Mm. So, oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, that I mean, like I think water could be a good analogy yeah, for course, this, yeah. right? Yeah. Water being uh, uh, probably the strongest force in nature. Yes, it changes the form all the time. All the time, yeah. When you put in this mug, it'll look molds. like a, it molds into the shape of the mug. Yeah. And if you spill on the floor, yeah. it'll look like a there's a flaw, and but it, its power <laughs> yeah. it doesn't disappear. Doesn't disappear, yeah. mm. and that's how we have to be like right. like water. To sorry to steal Bruce Lee's words, but <laughs> have to be like water, like because you yeah. you move with life, yes. and you are nothing ever defines you. See, mm. but the power is still there. Mm. So, and like to use water as the analogy, water seeks the low places, right? So it always remains humble. But mm. but it's the most power paradoxically the most powerful force in nature, mm. and that's how we have to be internally. Mm. We seek the low places. We remain humble, yeah. but we have because we're in contact with the Tao. Because you can only come in contact with the Tao with honest mm. humility, mm. and a humility that's not put on. It's kind of yeah. like really natural to you. Mm. Then that's where the power arises, and and so then you can move and. You, you, no role defines you, yes. as Zhuangzi would say. So you can move from one role to the other, yeah. but you know that you know the Tao. Mm -hmm. So that your shape may change, but the fundamental power, the, the water, yes. doesn't change. Yeah. Like what Derek Lynn says, like empty and yet never exhausted. Mm -hmm. So to use like space and emptiness as an analogy, same as water, right? Mm -hmm. Space itself mm -hmm. has a lot of power. Yes. And it's never exa never exhausted, yeah. like in the bellows, right? The yeah. bellows, it's an infinite. Just yeah. it just keeps going. Mm. It just keeps going. There's just mm. there's no end to that, right? Mm. So as it as it says, you know, the more it moves, so we're getting a bit further into the. Sec this is the last part of the second section. The more it moves, the more it yields. Mm. So the more it moves, the more it yields. Yields here means produce. Yes. So. The more that power moves through you, yes. as you, mm. the more, the more, the more you, you produce, produce, the more creative you are. Mm. You become like a bellow. Mm. So, um, emptier you become, um, creative the or more, creative, more yeah. authentic human being, you be, you become. Yes, kind of thing. That's where the genuine is. The genuine, mm. the the true person of Tao mm. is, mm. is in that nothingness because mm. the whole idea of the Tao is that mm. the Tao is this infinite s space mm. that this ultimate reality mm. that we can access by becoming a vest in some sense a vessel like the Tao yes and then it, you become like an aperture for the universe mm. to, to express itself yeah mm. again like in Korea in in Korean language we when we say uh, studying 
the Taoism and this and that. Mm. We, it's just an expression. You wiping the Tao, mm. like mm. it's just like a wiping, yeah, wiping the way and wiping your polluted mind. Yes, and to make it um, spotless. Yes, so make it as transparent, as empty as possible, mm. so that uh, your true nature can finally shine without any filter yep. without needing to have a filter or yeah just as it is as it itself yes and in itself mm. you're constantly polishing your mind yes cleaning it yeah polishing polishing is a polishing right no, polishing might be a bad i don't know polishing might be a good one but like mm. you're constantly cleaning your mind yes. like you said wiping the dowel mm. re- remaining that empty vessel yes because mm. if you're an empty vessel then the power of the bellows mm. can occur. Right. You know, mm. but if it's disturbed, mm. if there's like, say for mm. example, if you put mud inside the bellows, just like mud's just going <laughs> to, you know what I mean? It has no power then. Yes. Because mud has jammed it up. Yeah, bellow has no use for... No use. Yeah. It's not yeah. like a cream machine, like a, for cakes <laughs> and stuff like that. Like it's, yeah. it has no use like that. Yes. And that's what our mind is like. When we pollute our mind with all of this garbage, mm. then we are essentially our, our, our cup is full mm. and the space within the cup is gone. Mm. So the power is, mm. is useless. A full cup is useless mm. in, 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 in this context. So in metaphorically speaking, the bellows is, is, is a human being. It's a human being, yeah. yeah. That's what it is, yeah. yeah. It's a representation of the Tao, and we are a microcosm of the Tao. Again, it, it shape changes, but the form doesn't change. Doesn't change. It's the same yeah. thing. Like we may look different at, as we get older, mm. or we may have a different, may wear a different hat. Depends on the job that you have, but your true form doesn't change. No. Yeah. Which is the you are the bellow. Yeah, yeah. Which is, yes. <laughs> you are the infinite. Mm. The infinite yeah. space and power mm. is is within you, within mm. the bellows. Mm. So you may take on a job title, or you may take on a certain belief system, and this and that. But it's all informed mm. by the the space of the bellows mm. of the Tao. Yes. So, mm. and that's that's that idea, you know, like so. So you know, they like they they talk about in this one, like. So the more it moves, the more it yields. So this is why, uh, especially people, the benefit of this is people who become, people become creative. Yes. The more so, and to access that, what happens? So how do you access that? Well, you need to meditate more. Mm. You need to actually, like you said, continue to wipe the Tao. You have to continue to wipe. When you say wipe the Tao, wipe your mind. You have to continue mm. to clean your mind mm. of all of of from being warped. Mm. So we've all been warped since birth, right? Mm from this self-cultivation method that most societies mm. uh, believe in. But this self-cultivation method is, is anti-Taoist. It's against nature, mm. as you know, Zhuangzi's metaphor mm. of the unhewn wood as opposed to Confucius's metaphor of carving and polishing metaphor. We should carve and polish and cultivate and this and that, and Lao Tzu saying that's where all the troubles arise. As you mentioned before with you know, believing in all of this and that mm. and... and you become too complex and you are confused, essentially. Lao Tzu saying, return to your simplicity, get rid of all of these notions. And then once you do that, then that's how you become the bellows. That's where all the creativity comes from. So just as uh, like in between heaven and earth, if you're standing on earth and you look up into the heavens and there's clouds and so, so forth, all between that, there's all of this power. There's wind. Yeah. There's all of this, you know, there's... Mm-hmm all of this energy that's mm. happening within this so-called space and emptiness, mm. and that's a representation of mm. our mind as well. Yes. So when we are empty, then ideas not just emerge out of nothing. Mm. Creative insights mm. emerge out of nothing. Intuitions about mm. the right course of action emerge out of nothing, out of nothingness. But you can't access that at a, at a high level if your mind, if you've got mud in your bellows, yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, some of our uh, best experiences, for uh, to make an example of that, is um, like when we did uh, like an eighteen-day trekking. Yes. In, up in Himalayas in Nepal, like 
All you do day in day out is walking. Yeah. yeah. Walking in nature, basically trekking, go up to um, 5,600 meters high, and mm. all do you all you do every day, like at minimum five to six hours mm. every day walking. And every day. While you walk, like again, maybe some people may be listening to music through their earphones and things like that, but yeah, we don't have any of that, so we don't want to. We fully being in the present moment with nature in that moment and the list. Yes, step by step, each step we take, we try to get absorbed into that moment fully. Mm. And when you become completely one with that moment, where there's no thought, no such thought whatsoever, then that's the time when you have a real, uh, truest sense of uh, creative. Uh, thoughts arise, I think. Yeah. Uh, not in a sense of making something, creative something. It's not like that. It's a more a sense of, um, um, as in human life, how we ought to live as a true human being. That sense of creativity mm -hmm. kind of arise um, within within ourselves, and and that's the, the that eighteen days, the, the, the experience was the. Like a perfect example for that, um, having that creativity from having an empty space within our mind. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you remember when we were away and I had all of these ideas for articles and upcoming books and and so forth, and it just came from just walking. Nothing arising. I mean, nothing to do, and just like just <laughs> I, like an idea explosion because yeah, just, yeah. your mind is so empty mm. and it's not thinking it's like it's just these natural sort of spontaneous thoughts and that come mm. it just comes to comes you comes to you mm. yeah and this is the idea of the Tao right the Tao is this infinite wellspring that that continues to nourish us with insights and intuitions and wonderful ideas and this is what a creative person harnesses and taps into yes. right and so we know that, well, you and I know that personally because we, I, I write and, and, and create these YouTube videos and, and you're a musician. So and it doesn't mean you have to be a creative person, but, it, but it, what it also will mean for someone who's not a creative person is the right intuitions will come to you, you know, because there are intuitive errors, right? But when you are more like the bellows and you're more like the Tao, then the the right approach to certain things in life will will just you will just know the way to do it because mm -hmm. the, your intuition your mind is clear so the intuitions arise purely it's not clouded with concepts and ideas and beliefs about certain things you've just got rid of all that nonsense and then the Tao is just like you know throwing gold up for you to navigate the tricky terrain that we call life mm. right? right so that's kind of you know explaining that second part with the bellows right so you know the, the, there seems to be nothing in the bellows but its power is inexhaustible that's what we need to understand mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't fully understand that. like don't understand that that the Tao contains nothing but emptiness you know so and that that frightens people because people want to think about like a god or, or something like that but it's not like that you know the, the Tao is this, I, this, this kind of, you know, this infinitude of this voidness. Yeah. But that's where everything sort of comes. There's a power in that. Yeah. And it's incomprehensible to our finite mind. Yes. But that's the way life is, right? Yeah. It's incomprehensible, but you can only experience it. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. That's how you get the sense of what that is. Well, everything emerges out of that emptiness. Mm. If people want... people know that we all know that everything emerges out of that emptiness and you could you don't know why or how but that's the way it is that's the way the Tao is so you, you can you can you can come into contact with this right when you cultivate the Tao every day and that's the idea of the second part the more you cultivate the Tao every day the more you come into contact with with that process yeah and so and that's why meditation is important 
self-observation in, in a sense, like you said, wiping your mind and, and keeping out all of this nonsense. And Zhuang's this idea of fasting the mind, so keeping out all of the pollution that can make your mind toxic, mm. right? So everyone in the world now who are in, who are in conflict, if I had to be honest with them, I would say your mind is toxic. Mm. You know, I wouldn't be allowed to say that mm. because you know, the way the world is now, everything is too PC mm. and you're not allowed to speak the truth. You're not allowed to have fun and have humor either. But so, but that's the truth. Your mind is toxic because you've bought into sort of this reality you've created in your mind. Yes. You need to clean that and you need to, you need to live life as the Tao because you are the Tao. Yes. So. so now we move on to the last part of the chapter. More words count less, hold fast to the center. So this is the, what you would call the third part of this chapter, mm. like with, with Chinese language. It's, it's kind of broken down in three parts. But more words count less, hold fast to the center. This is pretty, I think, self-explanatory, right? Like the, the kind of the, as the, the first chapter kind of alludes to, you know, the more we speak about it, the less we understand it and, and so forth and so on. But... Also, when you understand this in Chinese properly, words here, like in English when it says more words, also means rules. Yeah. So, And we have to remember that the Tao Te Ching was, in some sense, a critique of the Confucian Analects and all of the Confucius's moral, you know, moral, ethics. moral ethics. So mm. um, in Chinese, it both the words, words here both means like being overly talkative, gossipy, someone who's attracted to rumors and also just speaking about knowledge that they don't really, really understand. Mm. And this idea that speaking about it, you lose it. So it means that and it also means uh, too many rules and regulations. Or it means rules and regulations, actually, words mm. here. So so the idea here, more words count less. Yes. So that means that we ought not to speak too much about this. Not, not talk too much about this, but not talk too much in general. Mm. And also um, try to avoid too many rules and regulations because yeah. society is imposing a certain belief system in your mind mm. that eclipses your understanding. I mean, not your understanding, but eclipses your connection with the Tao. Yeah. Because your mind, your bellows is full of mud and crap. Yeah, definitely. More rules and regulations we have, it seems like we lose... Uh, more of flavor and essence of our life. Yes. And we uh, we see it actually firsthand nowadays. It's yes. too many um, uh, to do and not to do and yeah. these things happening. So it kills the uh, character. It kills the uniqueness of individual yes. individual on and their own individual life yes. itself. Mm. Yeah, and we see this in everything, right? Like if you look at sporting competitions and stuff like that, there's this bad habit humans have because we are attracted to partiality where we see things in like, say, for example, in sport, something will happen and then they change all the rules and this and that and mm. they, they, people get attracted to changing rules and changing things that happen and not just sporting games but in societies and it just makes it much more complex and hard actually for a lot of people to follow. Yeah. And I think a lot of people that get in trouble with the law and this and that, I just don't navigate society well enough because it's become too complex. And society doesn't understand that people are still nature. Mm. Society is exactly. man-made, made by people of a certain intelligence that want certain uh, rules and regulations to dictate terms to the people. But we ourselves are still nature. And it's hard for a lot of people to apply themselves to those rules and regulations. So that's how we need to, to understand that line specifically. And a lot of people, especially New Age spirituality, who don't understand uh, the Tao Te Ching from its proper context and from its Chinese context, will just think that, oh, you're talking too much about it. That means you've lost the Tao. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? Okay. You know how I've, I've had a lot of comments yep. on, on the art of effortless living. You made a whole documentary about this. This means you don't know the Tao. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. I'm like, anyway. Let's move on. So if they only knew what it actually means instead of reading New Age interpretations and bad translations of the Tao Te Ching, yes. mind you, 
you're reading bad translations of the Tao Te Ching in English and you're not understanding what the actual Chinese context and the Chinese language is actually saying. Yes. Like we mentioned with straw dogs and like we mentioned here with words. Words means equally both talkative, gossipy, someone who's attracted to rumors and talking about things you don't know, not even in particular about the Tao, but just anything and also rules and regulations. So if we talk too much and we we wound up with too many rules and regulations, we become a warped person, which is basically most people in the world. You know. Again, like what I don't like about these um, misinterpretation of Tao Te Ching especially is that uh, some writers, they interpret Tao Te Ching in order to be um, help uh, to understand for Western-minded people mm. or Westerners mm. Tao Te Ching easier, mm. right? Mm. But to be honest, if you want to... If you want to read Tao Te Ching, mm. read a proper version mm. and give uh, put put a bit of effort to learn a little bit deeply, because otherwise you go you're trying to get a shortcut mm. and you get the um, easier translation version, mm. then you just gonna miss the point. Yes. Reading those misinterpretation of Tao Te Ching is going to lead you misunderstanding of the philosophy. Exactly. It's not going it, to... It's it actually not a help. No. It, it doesn't help you to understand Tao Te Ching. If you really... Again, there is no shortcut in this thing. No. I think if you want to learn about this, you need to do some work, mm. to be honest. Mm. Otherwise, you're going to miss complete... Uh, miss the point completely and you have your own interpretation of uh, Tao Te Ching and you think you, that is the absolute understanding and you're going to spread the word based on misinformation. That's what we have we call New, new Age, New, new age, age Spirituality, spirituality yeah. which is uh, um, they, they mold this ancient traditional philosophy into their own version to serve their own convenience, yes. and those people become somewhat in a powerful position, and they spread that version of philosophy as if that is the way, the real thing is, mm. and that's completely missing the point. And again, that's just we're just um, getting people get misled by these people and this um, uh, uh, incorrect knowledge yes. on this thing. Mm. Definitely. That's a big problem, big problem. The over-sensationalization of Eastern knowledge is, mm. is rife. And so when you talk sense, uh, you usually, well, as we know from my channel, I'll get like people aggressively saying that what we're talking about is the wrong knowledge because they read something in this translation, which everyone knows is a bad translation. And so you can't really say anything there you know what i mean like the whole like the whole thing is is that if you're on youtube and you're writing negative comments to someone that you don't know a complete stranger this is again partiality you are not really just you know experiencing reality as it is you know if people ask me how did you learn so many things i listened and didn't have opinions yes when i listened to teachers i listened because i knew that they're in a place of prominence and i'm just a, a beginner here but what we see on social media is the death of the expert. Now, I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I've done a lot of work in this field, whether you like it or not. And the thing is that if you continually shut down people that have done the work and you're basing your like your conclusion on false teachings... They credit too much to uh, loud people yeah, because they're just loud. Because they're loud, yeah. And they don't credit people who have a real knowledge. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, is that like, you, you should never be online negative to people because this is not humility and this is not the way to Tao. The way to Tao is the humble path. It's not the path of aggressiveness and and like troll, trollism, you know, so. Trollism yeah. became an ism. Be, yeah, I turned into an ism. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like I'm that trollism. Into ism, yeah. oh, he's, he's infected with trollism. So. <laughs> I like that, actually. Yeah, new ideology. New, new ideology. Trollism. Well, it's, oh. it's becoming a thing, isn't it? I like it. So, look, the, the, the method here, they actually have a method, right, at the end of this chapter. So, like, when more words count less, as we've described, with like 
rules and regulations and just being overly talkative and this and that, which people can be, right? And as we see with social media, what we've been talking about is hold fast to the center is, is, is the remedy right at the end. Now, this is a, a, an interesting perspective because what this really means is when you're drawing back into the center is you are drawing comfort from silence. So see, both of these lines sort of go together uh, where you're coming back into silence because the, the Tao or, or the bell, bellows which you are is an infinite nothingness it's a it's a silence it's a, it's also soundless you know what i mean like it has no sound so to speak so that's why when you know when people go on vipassana retreats and this and that when they stay quiet for 10 days a lot of things come to them and a lot of insights and this and that come to them because they've just shut the hell up for for the first time in their life you know and one of the big problems especially in western society is that people feel uncomfortable when there's a, when there's a, when there's a silence because the individualistic cognition of the West is so attracted to just speaking and having opinions and just... Just to fill up the silence. Fill up the silence, mm. fill up the space, mm. see? And this whole chapter is about embracing the space and understanding that within the space there is the power, there is the Tao. But when you're gibbering, like what we're doing now, when you're constantly gibbering, the power of the Tao is not there. I'm not saying the power of the Tao is not here in that conversation, but like when you're talkative and you're gossipy and it, the, the talk is idle chit chat, that's when things see. See, the Tao's not saying words themselves and talk itself is bad. It's saying the context of what is being said. So when it's frivolous chit chat, when it's gossipy, when there's rumors, that's what destroys the the, the potential of the Tao to move through your life. Yeah, I mean, like, we all feel draining. The energy is draining when we just <laughs> doing really meaningless, pointless gossip over something that's completely irrelevant <sighs> to you. It's There's nothing more exhausting than that for no. me, personally. I, I just mm. I just step away. Like, mm -hmm. I yeah, I can't... Yeah, it's too much. Too much. Yeah. It's too much, too much to yeah. handle. Yeah, yeah, too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, yeah. uh, let me I buy a mudra. Yeah, I buy a mudra. It's all good. I'm yeah. good. I don't need to be part of this. Other people can take it. What's your opinion, this. Jason? I'm just looking at vacant like... <laughs> You're yeah, asking a wrong question to a wrong person. There's nothing to say, man. I, I have no idea. Yeah. Again, I like I think um in any in any conversation it's actually not just in a conversation when you want to learn something if you want to uh, like uh, get something in order learn something to grow and to progress making real progress in life I always think that you got to come up with the empty plate. Mm. You come come with the empty plate, the clean, pristine empty plate. Mm -hmm. You have uh, infinite tolerance to take anything on that plate mm -hmm. without any preconceived ideas mm -hmm. or prejudice and whatnot. Yeah. I think that attitude is is important. Definitely, and that's why I always discuss with you privately because um, it may be a result of the way I was brought up with not many too, too many rules and regulations and, and sort of no belief systems and this that's from my mom and dad. But like, other some of my other friends, like when we would study this knowledge, they would like, uh, like for example, I had one friend who was reading Alan Watts the book, right, and was saying, ah, oh, you know, it's all right. I don't really agree with a lot of the things he's saying, though. And the thing is, is that like I sort of thought to myself because everything I would read and and every teacher I met and everything is that I didn't really have a, f a framework. So I'm listening like it's just like a sponge. Like I'm just like, wow. Because like, when I read the book, my experience was completely different than, than my friend because I was just like fully blown away. I was like, wow, like never thought about it that way. I never, th nothing like I don't agree with Alan, what Alan said here. None of that even it came. It became one of the favorite books by Alan. Yeah, exactly. It probably is my favorite book by Alan. And so it was not like, I, I didn't, there's nothing to a disagree. From, from where I sit, there was nothing to disagree with him about. Do you know what I mean? Because I didn't have a perspective. I didn't have 
like a strong sense of self. And like I said, that may be because of how my parents brought me up and so forth. Maybe, you know what I mean? Or maybe my mind was just adapted for this sort of knowledge. I don't know. But like that's how I always approached all of this knowledge is you know, like when I came across Advaita Vedanta when I was younger, Taoism, Buddhism, I'm just like loving it. Mm. Just like like the insights I was gaining from studying, you know, is uh, innumerable. You yes. Know? yes. So, but like what I see in this day and age, especially because of social media, and and we get this in, on my channel where people say, "I don't dis- I disagree with what you're saying here and this and that," and I always just think that of myself, like, like how are you ever going to learn? Mm. Like I'm not saying I'm the king of philosophy or anything mm. like that, but. I've done the work and you can't listen without saying you disagree. Mm. So how are you ever going to learn properly? The learning and the growth, in the process of learning and the growth, it comes from that either neither agree or disagree. Yeah. You have to have this kind of um, open mind mm. to be able to grow. Mm, exactly. So it's so important to have just an open mind, just a clean slate. Come up with just an attitude of just being okay with that you don't know, yeah. right? Without having that attitude, like where is the room to improve or grow and learn, you know? Mm. Like just so it's like it's okay to not to say disagreeing or agree. Mm. Just a, keep that open mind mm. and just come up with just a. Again, like empty plate mm. and just be able to tolerate anything that you hear or you read. Mm. And just from doing so, only I think you can learn and only that you have the growth. That well, that's where the spiritual growth comes from, right? And that's, that's an important point because the thing is like we were talking about, like disagreeing itself, when you disagree, it means you have a solidified identity. And see, you and I have experienced this a lot. And, you know, we've been talking about the Western mind a little bit. And especially when Westerners, when because you know, we've spent a lot of time in India, for example, and you go to like satsang, right? Satsang means to sit in truth or to sit in truth with a teacher in a group setting to be more precise. And so technically a guru. And so it's interesting because when you go to India and, and this and that, You never see like, and maybe foreigners get influenced by their environment over there, you know, because you become your environment. But like, for example, Indians don't have this mentality where they disagree with someone fully because they have a deep respect for the guru. Mm -hmm. And their approach is like their mentality is not that they disagree with the guru, but maybe they're just a bit confused on a certain thing that the guru said, right? But um, for example, you would never get like a person that would go, like a foreigner would go, to, would would never go to the guru and say, "I disagree with what you're saying," and try to prove a point. I mean, I've seen it maybe once, like at a, at a Muji satsang, but I've never seen it at, at a white, like especially with Indian swamis or, or gurus. I've never seen it again. Muji being a teacher in West. the Western world, especially in Europe, so I've seen it once or twice with him, but. You don't generally see it because especially people who come to satsang, especially if you follow and fight to Vedanta, you're coming with a perspective that you don't know and you seek the knowledge. Yeah. That's what it is, right? You are seeking the not you are seeking to know. So you have a seeker's mind. And so you're not coming there going, I disagree with what you said, like I said with my friend with the book, right? Like he said, like, you know, I disagree with what Alan says, and it's like, why are you just not reading it for for what it is? And why do you disagree? Like you should be asking yourself, why? Mm. You know, and this is becoming the big problem in mm. part of, especially the social media environment, where we have people who are disagreeing with each other and are showing no respect towards each other because they are they are loud and and barking over the top of other people to to promote their own agenda and influence the world in their own way. They're cancelling individuals and this and that. When you know public shaming was outlawed century ago you know and so yeah there's a deep uh, lack of uh, respect and being humble 
exactly. in the Western world, isn't it? Yeah. Like, again, that's a, that played a big part, that attitude, I think, yeah. in just ability to just sit and listen with the open mind. Yes. Uh, ability to listen and have an open mind is to have a respect to other other people mm. and being able to humble as well, yeah. I think. And that's, um, again, what's lacking in this uh, day and age. People in the Western world, they... Um, they all yell out the freedom of speech and this and that. Mm. But I see the big irony that the people who yell out that uh, kind of things, they themselves don't actually practice freedom of speech, no. for example. Especially when they get in touch with the exotic culture. Yeah, yeah. It's just something not familiar with them. Mm -hmm. And th those um, people who come from different culture have a different background, different point of view, and different perspective in things, uh, mm. uh, may become in conflict with the way they sit. Mm -hmm. But they seem to be very intolerant to that exotic culture. And don't respect them. Yeah. So they are they are yelling out this freedom of speech, but they don't really practice in reality. No. So I, I don't see the, the... That's kind of nonsensical, isn't it? Well, see, freedom of speech should be the byproduct of intrinsic human values, of humility, uh, compassion, forgiveness, you know, all of the end respect and yeah. honor. Right, so if we if we respect each other in general, then that's how things usually find um, harmony in union. Right, so instead of me coming to you in opposition in an aggressive manner, I come to you halfway to listen to your perspective, and then you listen to my perspective, and then we we develop a relationship from there. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing with all of this woke ideology and all of these people who are who are canceling people is they're not really listening to other people and other people's perspectives, which means they don't respect someone else. And so in the East, what is of paramount importance is respect. Yeah. And that is why you don't see a lot of people like disagreeing with teachers and experts and it's not because they give respect to the expert or they give respect to the guru or the spiritual right. teacher. Mm -hmm. You know. But in the West we develop this idea that we know best. Right, we know best, and you know Japan's a good example of how we should approach this because you have this mentality of that we come into this relationship as friends first and foremost, mm -hmm. and even if we disagree on a certain matter, we can come halfway. This is part of Japanese culture. It was part of Korean and Chinese as well, but it's still practiced a lot more in Japan yeah. in the modern day. So. That's why in business decisions and this and that, when Westerners will, will deal with Japanese, there's a mentality of like, we have to walk away from this uh, interview or this meeting as friends mm. first. Mm. And then we can, we can put our petty little differences aside because we are mature people yes. and we can come halfway because we respect yes. each other. Yeah, instead in the Western world, we just want to um, get our voice heard. Yes. And you just like uh, ignoring the other people's opinion and whatnot. Exactly. And you know best. Uh, yes, exactly. And that that's a certain level of a um, dictatorship, I think. Yes. And you're not open to listen to other people, and that's not a um, peaceful process. No. Whereas, like you mentioned in Japan, it's, it's things are different. It's mm. it, uh, you come in as friends yeah. and you walk out as friends as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what's important. In, in that harmony, uh, they can uh, go to the common goal m more harmonious uh, way. Yeah. And they can um, go after something bigger goal to achieve for both parties. For both parties, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of like trying to influence them with their way. Like, and that's, that's been kind of a hallmark of the Western cognitive style of individualism, right? Like, which is infiltrated into Christianity. Hence, Christianity went around the world trying to convert everyone because they know best. And it's, it's, mm. it, it's actually a survival strategy based on demographic swamping, right? Yeah. Like to, to, to be precise and to the point. And that's what we see with like woke ideology and cancel culture and this and that. It's a, a, a new form of that same mentality.
Mm. It's a Christian perspective, mm. but it's a Western individualistic cognitive style. It's a, it's a evolutionary strategy to keep your agenda, your beliefs in that alive over and above someone else. So we can just cancel them and squash them and their opinion, and that keeps us alive. But the fact of the matter is, is that those people attracted to cancel culture and so forth and so on are such a small minority. And because the, ma- the majority, 99.99% of the people are just good, decent people who are hardworking people who have families to take care of, and they don't really have time for all of this loud gibberish that they hear on the news and this and that, they don't speak up. But if the, if the majority did speak, finally, if they did raise their voice, that little cancel culture thing that's going on, the woke, the woke ideologist would cower in the corner because it would be overwhelming. Yes. And the problem is, is the media and that they blow up all of that. Mm. And some of those media organizations actually agree with a lot of that woke, that woke stuff mm. and are just against common sense. Yeah. So once you allow these infectious ideas to come into your mind, it destroys common sense, mm. right? And so Eastern spirituality is about enhancing common sense yeah. and not falling prey to certain infectious ideas that warp your nature and confuse and rule your mind. Yeah, again, the, sim- that's, the last two lines is a perfect uh, the summary of that, isn't yeah. it? Like, yeah, more, more words. More words count less. Mm. And, uh, Hold fast to center. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, mm. exactly. And so that's the thing, like the, from their perspective, from this new cancel culture thing, more, uh, more, words, more words are better and more opinions are better, more gossip is better. And see, Lao Tzu tears that right down. He says, no, 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 it's not better. It's worse because you don't know your true nature. You are identifying with an identity that was a construct of your process as a human, the particular culture you were in, the particular education you were in, and that's all filling your mind cup. It's not you're not enhancing the space. You're out of contact with the Tao, mm. Mm. and that's why the last line mm. says we need to draw comfort from silence. Mm. We need to come back into the center. And as we were mentioning, that Western society have a big problem with a silence, right? Like it's there's an uncomfortability with the silence yeah. for a lot of uh, Westerners because the whole culture is built on like. It's a talkative culture, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and like I said, there's nothing wrong with being talkative. It's it's the context of the talk, yeah. And this is why in the East that, though, for sure, gossip and all of that it ha- has existed in the East as well. But it has it has not existed in the East as much as the West, where in the West it's become even a commodity, where you have gossip magazines, and this and that, where everyone's constantly talking about other people, yeah. And so. You are not attracted to silence. You're attracted to just talking about someone else based on your image, based on their image. Yes, yes. Which is all an illusion because you because the image yourself is only a shape that you are embodying at that moment. But that shape may change. Yeah. And it's the space that informs the, the change. Exactly. And again, um, we like we get to sit uh, with the colleagues in the same space and mm. and sometimes like there's no word being said at all like really quiet mm. everyone's doing their own thing and mm. uh, enjoy a cup of tea or something and mm-hmm. it's being really quiet and there's some other person walk into the room and say oh i was too quiet <laughs> and i said yeah. uh, and i said i said oh i love this quietitude mm-hmm. and like oh you like being quiet yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not bad <laughs> it, it's somewhat like something very uncomfortable to that individual you know and but again from that quietitude we harness the energy we attract we con con we contract the energy back into ourselves yes, we, yes. we 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 collect that energy back into ourselves from the silence yes and again we nowadays we need to almost like a give an effort to have a, those moments yes but if necessary, it's very important to have those moments. Well, that's why this, like what you were mentioning, this last part of the chapter is the strategy to harness that power of Tao. Mm. That's what it is. 
this is how you let go of the banks of the river and stop fighting the current and you allow the river's power to become your power mm -hmm. you are essentially getting out of too many words not being you you are not attracted to leaking your energy out into the world you're not attracted to you know to use the hundun analogy you're not leaking your energy right. out through the holes in your face and you're not depleting your energy systems you are harnessing like what you said the energy you're bringing back the focus within yourself yes. and uh wiping wiping the Tao, mm, wiping, wiping your, your mind, mind and you are becoming a vessel for the Tao to make use of because that's what you are that's what like what we mentioned earlier with the bellows mm. and and the uh straw dogs is that you then perform your particular function and purpose yeah that's the whole idea but but the but the strategy to do that is to come back into silence yeah. and to become comfortable with silence yeah. if you're if you are uncomfortable with silence it's going to be a big problem it's going to be a big problem again um i think it's so important to understand what our existence is and mm. where it's coming from mm. and that is that place of silence mm -hmm. and we need to get comfortable with it because that's where we come from and that's where we're going to go back to. So only from being in the space of silence, we can be the most authentic human being that we could be. Exactly, exactly. So it's not that, this is the thing, right? So, so the Tao is formless and it's, like I said, it's soundless. It has no sound. Mm -hmm. It's formless and has no sound. And so you as a, as a like an integration of that energy as a reflection of the whole you too also have to be formless and soundless to harness its potentiality that's the thing and formless here being formless in your mind not having a solidified state of personality that you think is who you are yeah you've loosened the grip on that and it's become as you said with the water before you, mm. you kind of it's moving yeah. it's not defined by a particular thing mm. and that's and 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 also in in the silence as well right so you're formless and you're also quiet yeah so and not just quiet uh in the in the vocal perspective quiet in your mind yes, that's right that's actually this is more important that's what's important it doesn't matter what's going on out here you can mm. you can be in conversation with someone but you can be internally quiet yes and actually when you find that quietude your conversations actually become better too and more enriching yeah. because the right intuitions and the right ideas come to you at the right time when you're engaged in the conversation. Yeah. The Tao is in full motion. Yeah. You know? Yeah, 100%. That uh, quietude within ourselves is much more important than... we. You, I mean, we can sit in silence for, to meditate for hours, but mm. if our mind is busy and chasing our own thoughts and this and that, and it's, it's, it can be also exhausting. Yeah. Yeah, you need to practice the quiet, quiet in the mind at all times and as much as possible mm. in our daily life. And mm. again, when you go for a walk, exercise, even when you eat... Mm. Anytime you can practice. Anytime, yeah. Yeah, there's silence. That's right, that's right. And that's what this chapter is about. Yeah, this is what this chapter is about. It's about realizing that impartiality and harnessing, becoming the bellow. Yeah. Becoming the bellow. And at the end of the chapter, it tells you sort of how to, how to become that bellow. Yes. You know, you have to kind of clean out all of the toxic garbage that we've accumulated. And this state of personality we think we are or the state of persona we think we are mm. you know that f false identity false identity yeah mm. that you've accumulated right it's an accumulation of yes of an image of what society thinks you should be yeah so the job is to empty all that out empty all that out mm -hmm. and so guys that's the that's the that's our examination of chapter five we hope you guys enjoyed it make sure you go and check out the first four episodes if you're yep. new around here mm -hmm. and we'll see you guys next week <laughs>